apologies for the lighting. Um, I want to discuss, uh, I guess, what's deemed a controversial topic. Um, I was watching a YouTube debate between, uh, I think, the spokesperson of AfriForum, Ernst, Ernst Roots. Uh, I think this guy is, uh, I think he's on Talk Radio 702, uh, Eusebius Makeza, and uh, the leader of uh, BLF, Andile Mutama. Uh, and they were debating racism. Uh, Andile was obviously saying that he feels white people should never be asked about racism or speak about racism because they are obviously racist and they are beneficiaries of apartheid. Um... Ernst, in his usual manner, uh, for those who have ever watched any of his debates, very calm, uh, constantly relying on historic data, um, and almost always takes advantage of black people's emotions. Black people get very emotional when it comes to racism and apartheid in our history, and guys like Ernst are almost always ready, you know, to counter all the, the attacks from... From black people but while I was I was listening to them uh, I thought of something some white guy once said to me on social media you know I was, I was quite upset when he said it and I was very much in disagreement but I think hours or days later I found myself thinking about what this guy was talking about and he was saying white people didn't steal anything in, in South Africa. Uh, everything that white people achieved, acquired, accumulated was based on conquest. Conquest obviously coming from the word conquer, which means white people conquered black people to almost earn the land, earn the resources and earn the privileges and the advantages that they had and that they have in this country. Black people, even today, are still very angry, you know, about our history, of course. Um, black people today demand that white people give back the land. They demand that white people share the economy, that white people apologize for apartheid. Can you imagine people getting worked up when... Guys like F.W. de Klerk was saying uh, apartheid is not a crime against humanity. Number one, black people don't want to have the conversation about how we lost the land. You know, I, I do this exercise on a regular basis where I try to engage black people on how we lost the land. What happened? How did it happen? And we never want to talk about it. Black people get emotional and the one thing black people normally lean on is the fact that white people had advanced weapons, guns, we had spears, etc. So it's true, white people had superior weapons, you know. But when you're fighting someone, you, you can't lower yourself to their weakness to make it a fair fight. I can't when I'm fighting a small guy. Now try and make myself smaller to accommodate this guy. Or I'm fighting for someone. It's a matter of life and death. He has a knife. I have a gun. And I must throw away my gun to make it a fair fight and pull out a knife. And for the rest of his family's life, they're going to complain that I used a gun and their child used a knife. And for the rest of my life, I must be apologetic for defeating their son who had a knife, who had an inferior weapon. Or if I was a bigger guy, I must be apologetic that I was bigger and dominated their son. And that's what black people expect of white people. They expect white people to be apologetic for having advanced weapons, maybe advanced strategy, and for using whatever means they could to dominate black people and take black people's land, black people's resources, and in turn, enslave black people through 
getting them to beg to be workers for white people on this land using this capital. Black people don't have that discussion. And two weeks ago, one of the things I was saying was, if black people and white people were to fight today, black people would lose again. Because I know a lot of white people, even with their children who have guns, who are very pro-guns, who take their children to the, to the shooting range, they teach their children how to shoot. Um, black people don't do that. Black people aren't taking their kids to the shooting range. Black people, the most that I know, are very anti-guns. Guns are bad. Guns kill. So if blacks and whites were to fight again, white people would win. They'd defeat us again because they have the weapons. We don't. We don't even... <laughs> clever blacks don't even have nobkiris in their houses. We're so anti-violence and anti-guns that we, we sit naked. You know, so... We were beaten with better weapons, apparently. The other thing black people don't want to talk about is the numbers game. There weren't a lot of white people when fights were breaking out over things like land. There are very few of them and large masses of blacks. But they defeated large masses of blacks with small groups of white people. Not just in South Africa, but across the continent. You know when you watch the movie 300, The Spartans? It's reminiscent. Small group, small army. Sorry, my network is acting up. Small groups of white people that went around the continent defeating large groups of black people using weapons or strategy or whatever the case may be. And today those black people are miserable. They, they lost. And black people don't admit that we lost. Your, your favorite ancestors, your favorite forefathers lost to a group of white people who came here and defeated them and set up laws uh, to make them inferior and to keep them inferior and to keep them in a very small part of the land and in turn get your forefathers to come and be workers for them in the mines and on the farms and in factories. We don't want to have that discussion. You know, it's an emotional discussion. People get angry. No, white people must give back the land. If I conquered you and I took your land, your car, your business, I'm not going to give it back. I'm not. If you want it back, you have to defeat me. There needs to be some type of a rematch or you need to use some type of go get better weapons than I have. Use better strategy than I have and defeat me. Otherwise, if you're not going to defeat me, I'm going to keep that stuff. You can call it theft, but I beat you. As far as I know, white people didn't hoodwink black people. The fights were what you would basically call fair. We were beaten. And if we'd beaten white people then, we'd call it today, we'd be victorious. We'd go around saying, we beat white people. And maybe some people would argue, well, it's because there were so many blacks at the time. In a discussion I was having, I was asking, what's the difference between what Ushaga Zulu achieved in KZN uh, versus what white people did? Ushaga defeated smaller tribes and in essence colonized a huge piece of land which ended up being named Guazulu, named after him, defeated them, took over all of that land, became his and he even got those tribes to speak his language, forced them like proper colonization to speak Zizulu and today in South Africa Zizulu is the most spoken language but no one goes around calling Ushaga a colonizer, an oppressor, that Ushaga stole land and he must give it back to the smaller... No one says that. Ushaga Zulu is celebrated. But white people who came and did the same thing. And mind you, today we've got Guazulu, uh, Natal, but we've got Guazulu, which is defined and named after this guy. White people came and defined South Africa. I don't know if South Africa was defined before white people came. Obviously, the history books we have are written by white people. And when you speak to black people, their knowledge so limited because how we pass on information is through word of mouth and then you have broken telephone but what was south africa called before white people came here how was it split up besides using landmarks like a river or a mountain how did black people denote who whose land belonged to who to a point where you can say when a white person lands that no he landed on umtlaba for example how do we know he wasn't landing on barren land? 
Even today in South Africa, there's big chunks of land that no one lives on, especially in places like the Northern Cape. Northern Cape is so pop. It's got horrible, horrible chunks of land there. No one wants to go live there. No one wants to go live there. So if a white person goes and he sits up there and he builds the same way they built Las Vegas in the desert in Nevada, if a white person goes and builds Sun City or Sandton City on that piece of land in the Northern Cape that no black person wants, and in a few years or a few decades, it becomes the most valuable piece of land in the country, on the continent. Now, all of a sudden, black people want that land. That's our land. That's our ancestral land. That's the land that belonged to the Khoisan. How do you know? Based on what? Where's the evidence? Some of the land is pretty clear. You know, there were fights over certain pieces of land. There were fights. They were documented. They there. Similarly, if you look at uh, the Lands Act, I don't know if it's the Bantu Lands Act, where white people relegated black people to townships, moved them from places like Sofia Town, for example, into places like Soweto. That's documented. You can track that. You can say, no, man, Sofia Town was owned by black people. Black people must get that land back. You can easily track that. And I'm still fascinated that with the Codessa negotiations, the ANC didn't start off by saying, let's ring fence all this land that you guys forced black people off of, ring fence it, and then give it black, back to black people. And then black people can then choose to either sell that land back to you or to lease it to you or just choose to say, no, we're going to keep the land. That, that land was pretty straightforward. There, there are other huge chunks of land which are, are very much up for debate. But that land is very clear. It's documented. Black people, my grandmother, my mother, my father, know, they know some of these pieces of land where they were shifted off of. They know it. They're like, we live there. That should have been a non-negotiable. That should have been like all the land that you guys shifted us off of, whether it's a commercial farm or whatever today, it doesn't matter. We're giving it back to the blacks. You guys can then negotiate or decide or whatever. Are these blacks going to now sell you the land so you must pay them what's fair? Uh, or are they going to lease it to you, carry on with your commercial farm, but you must pay us rent? Or are they going to say, no, we don't care that you have a commercial farm. This is our land. We're taking over it. Whatever's on this land, it's ours now. You guys pushed us off this land illegally. Uh, now, it was legal back then, but the laws have changed because we've negotiated after the struggle. But that wasn't done. When you look at the negotiations that were made, white people lost nothing. Black people celebrate that we won apartheid, but white people lost nothing. A few black people gained some privileges to move into the townships some of them got shares but the bulk of blacks maybe five to 98 percent of black people nothing changed they still stayed in the same township no one gave them any extra money no one gave them any extra compensation no white person came to say i'm sorry for what i did to nothing those white people that caused those atrocities are not in jail desmond tutu and the trc made sure that those people were forgiven turn the other cheek. White people lost nothing. If anything, from 94 till now, it's documented that white people have made the most wealth in that period. More money than they made during apartheid. But black people get emotional. And I really wish, I really wish black people could just, number one, before, before we go anywhere, number one, just acknowledge. Acknowledge. My forefathers lost I love my forefathers, they in my DNA, my genes, my, my bloodline, but they lost. A war came, white people came with better weapons, whatever, and they lost. Cool. At some point, the ANC, the PAC, and other black groups came together and said, guys, we've lost, let's fight back. Let's get a voice. And sadly, most of them were fighting for inclusion. They weren't fighting to get the land back. They were fighting to be included in the discussions between the British and the Afrikaners, who had set up uh, the Union of South Africa, which was under the, the, the Queen in England. Black people wanted to be included. They weren't fighting to say, we want the land back, and then we'll decide what happens. They were saying, no, we're fighting to come and sit at the table with you guys. So they fought. Uh, the struggle happened. Um was set up. I think they were setting up in Angola and Zambia and those places. Um, and just before I think a, war was, a civil war was meant to break, 
in South Africa, if W. De Klerk and all those guys sat with all Mandela and said, look, let's negotiate. Kodesa happened. Guys like Otabo Mbegi and Abo Zuma were called to the front. Guys like Abo Cyril and Abo, um, is it Rulof, Rulf, Mayor, came and they negotiated and they made certain decisions, you know. But black people didn't really gain much and white people didn't lose anything. So black people need to accept we lost. We tried to fight back. There was never really a fight. Instead, there was a negotiation, negotiated settlement. In the negotiated settlement, we found a democracy. And in the democracy, we had a constitution and we could vote as the people of South Africa on how South Africa is to be run. Voted, we keep voting, we keep voting. And unfortunately, blacks are still not getting what they feel they deserve. They keep voting for the African National Congress, which had a freedom charter, which included things like getting the land back, making sure we have a stake in the economy, making sure there's free education, and those things are not coming. Instead, black people have been turned into glorified orphans. South Africa, or the bulk of South Africa, has been turned into a glorified orphanage, where black people are given free housing, they're given uh, free health care, free education, they're given a grant, they're given uh, food packs, um, so that they can eat and get by. But they're not given their dignity back in the sense of, here's your piece of land, um, here's your chance to, to create your own economy, to make your own money, etc., etc. None of that has happened. But the same black people vote every single time there's an election for have, to have a caretaker in the ANC, a caretaker that makes sure it feeds them, number one, and in the, in the same breath, it kind of makes sure that white people's privilege is still protected. And that ANC is funded by the biggest economic players in the country who happen to have been the biggest beneficiaries of apartheid as well. Today, these guys fund the ANC to protect their privileges, to ensure that we have Roman Dutch law, which is not African law. It's Roman Dutch law, which ensures that certain laws are in place like theft. A white man could have stolen land from my family back then, defeated my grandfather, of course, and today, if I go and take that land back, it's called a crime, and I get put in prison. That white man went and he apologized and he was forgiven. I, I, I am called a criminal and I'm put in jail under Roman Dutch law. My African law and my African customs can't say that land is mine. They'll ask, where's your title deed? Where's your title deed? If we go and we fight back the way we were supposed to, that's called crime. White people today are, are, are calling for white genocide. When you're trying to get land back and fight the way they fought, the way they used weapons on us. When we try and do the same thing, it's called a crime and we put in jail. And it's protected by the African National Congress. And guys like the Economic Freedom Fighters, Abo Julius Malima, they talk a big game, but they're not really doing much to change that either. And they enjoying nice votes. Obviously, a lot of them are privileged. They live in the suburbs. They earn good salaries. They, they have a stake. Apartheid built a lot of wealth in the country. After the negotiations, there were things like BEE, where black people were given shares in companies. And what happens with a share when you get a BEE share? See if I can paint a picture. A white person comes and he steals your father's car, right? Steals your father's car. You guys threaten to fight back. The white person says, no, let's negotiate. When they negotiate, they find a caretaker somewhere and they, and they say to the caretaker, listen, we're not going to give the car back. But what we're going to do is uh, on every Saturday, we'll give you a chance to ride in the car. Car's still mine. I own it. But I'll give you a stake in the car. And on Saturdays, you can drive that car as much as you want. But then Sunday to Friday, the car is mine. And even on Saturday, please know that the car is mine. I'm just going to loan it to you to drive around on that day. And the ANC agreed to that. So they own shares in companies that they do not control. Um, they, they can't even fix some of the policies in these companies to, to hire a bulk of Africans, to, to hire a bulk of African suppliers. They just glorified car lenders on a Saturday. And that's meant to make sense in this country. And... I think my, my big, the big moral of, of the story for me is 
black people really need to accept that we lost, guys. We lost. And losing is fine. You lose in many different things in life. But you need to acknowledge that you lost. Denialism is a huge problem. Accept it. We lost. Number two now, you say, you ask, how did we lose? Because when you look at the how did we lose, it's going to ensure that in future, we can try and ensure we don't lose like that again. At least. We can lose in a different way. But let's not lose like that again. Let's not lose to superior weapons. Do black people have superior we weapons to white people today? We don't. So if there was another war to break out, we would lose the same way we lost back then. Nothing, we would have learnt, learnt nothing. Learn how we lost so we ensure we don't lose like that again. And then try and preempt for the future. If we are to fight these people, how can we ensure that we beat them definitively? Beat them. Not just physically, but psychologically as well. Conceptually, ideologically. Let's beat them. You know what I mean? And you, you can study many wars in history on, on how to achieve that. I mean, many empires have, have been built. The Romans, the Ottoman, the, the way Christopher Columbus and the Spaniards took over America. Uh, Genghis Khan, Mao in Asia. There's a lot of stories about wars that you can learn from. Guys like Napoleon, guys like Mussolini. And so much that you can learn about war strategy and how to win wars. And then we have to, have to fight to win. We don't need to use guns. I mean, there are so many new uh, ways, strategic ways to win. You can use music. Uh, you can use literature. Uh, you can use biological warfare. I mean, there's arguments that the coronavirus is biological warfare. You can use biological warfare. You can use economies of scale. You can use religion. You can get all black people to be under one religion, which makes it a sin to support anything that is not black. That's just a psychological win and you get white people to say i want to be black too and win with you guys there are so many different ways to fight and win but we need to fight one of the rules of fight club is that you have to fight because that's the only way we can win you you can't win by not fighting you want to be gandhi and sit quietly it's a form of fighting as well but you believe that begging is a form of fighting Black people are going to beg their way to get the land back, to get the economy back, to get their dignity back. Maybe if we beg for long enough, white people will eventually feel guilty and then give us back the land. And a, a, a person with a winner victim mindset never ever falls victim to that. If anything, when you beg, it's almost a license for them to dominate you even more. You're almost begging to be dominated. So I, I don't think begging is the best strategy. Uh, we need to look into better strategies and we need to win. That's now in South Africa and maybe on the African continent. Black people are, are, are struggling here. We haven't even considered the idea of potentially colonizing other parts of the world. Let's go to China and take over all the factories there. And as much as the population is 1.3 billion Chinese people, let's go and put black people who own all the factories and they'll own the means of production. And when people talk about China, they'll be like, yo, China where the blacks own the factories. Let's do the same in Europe. Let's go take over BMW, go take over Audi, go take over Mercedes-Benz, go take over Adidas, go take over Puma, go take over... There. We're not even thinking about getting there because we're such big losers here. We have no strategy for here that we can't even begin to think about going to take over America. How can we take over America using hip-hop, using basketball, using whatever? And all of a sudden, every white person wants to be black, wants to be associated with black, wants to loan money from a black bank to build enterprise, wants to work on a black-owned plantation, wants to work in a black-owned factory. We're not even thinking of that, and it's happening in our country. Small minority groups are coming to destroy us. Economic wars. The Spaza shops have been taken over by Pakistanis. They didn't hit anyone. They're not forcing us to learn their language. They're not forcing us to go to their churches. But through economies of scale, collaboration, unity, and buying in bulk, they have taken over Spaza shops. And today we have to buy from them and we give them every single... Indians, the Chinese, China malls, China cities. These guys didn't hit us. 
They didn't oppress us and relegate us off the land. They, they're fighting economically and winning. Using intelligent strategies that have been used over centuries. In trade. Black people are not even having that discussion. We just get angry. We get angry on social media and we make memes. And we vent. And we make these videos where we going ham. Just saying, yeah, my black brother, my black sister. You know, we must, we must fight the black man and the black woman. Must come together and unite. Yeah, my brother, black love. We don't have a strategy to actually fight various wars and win them. We've lost the spiritual war. Every black person is a Christian and worships a white Jesus. <laughs> if you see a white man with long blonde hair and blue eyes, how can you not want to bow to that person? That's Jesus. That's your savior. That's the person that died for your sins. <laughs> You're a fucking sinner. And, and white people constantly reinvent different strategies to destroy the black nation. Very controversial as well, but they'll empower black women. Make black women get jobs and earn an income and then disempower black men so that black women see that black men ain't shit. These deadbeats can't even provide. They have no jobs. You know, what can a black man do for me? You know, and your food's black man. Black men obviously get frustrated because men are fucking useless. And they go home. They obviously drink, they take drugs, and they start beating their woman because they couldn't defeat the, the, the white man. So let's go for the next best thing, the woman you claim to love. Let's beat her up. That's going to make you feel like the hero now. Ooh, powerful Mr. Man. But to us, tomorrow you're going to be standing on a street corner begging him for a job or begging him for money. Or as we saw in a video, standing in a long queue for white or Muslim Indian NPOs that are going to feed you. Because you, you have no dignity. You have no sense of self-worth. No identity. You go to church and clap for a white Jesus. Uh, your kids are sent to white schools. Where they then afterwards have to go beg white people for jobs. With their dirty useless CVs. With their grammatical errors and bad English. And you're just lost. Take every little bit of money that you get. And you buy from white owned takeaways. And you get loans from white banks and you go and owe someone a car and you get a bond it's a mess it's a mess but the first step is to acknowledge guys we lost we lost now that we've lost how did we lose okay how can we ensure we don't lose like that again and now let's strategize number one physical fighting black people need to get guns black people need to get army tanks black people need to get into nuclear weapons the reason kim is such a badass motherfucker in North Korea is because he can bomb the shit out of America. He can bomb the shit out of the UK. He can bomb the shit out of Russia. No one plays with Kim. Every now and then Kim fires like a test missile just to remind these motherfuckers that I'm a bad motherfucker. I can bomb the fuck out of you and your whole family. We need, we need those weapons. We need land. If we need to fight for land, if we need to outmaneuver people and get them to give us land for free somehow if we need to go into other parts of the world and go set up camp in germany and spain and america and in, in india and china and korea and go do that go set up camps go set up these black african camps where you're fucking playing your baboon music and you eat your baboon food but you know that you have a strategy we're trying to fucking africanize every single major city in the world and then start fighting and get your identity back. And get your spirit back. And get the economy. And dominate. Guys, there's nothing wrong with domination. Fuck what Nelson Mandela said. Fighting against black domination and white dom... It's bullshit. There's nothing wrong with dominating. Winning is what everyone wants. And black people have been somehow psychologically fucked and confused to believe that we must chase equality. There's no race in the world except for black people that actually believes in equality. And chases and begs for it. Quality is rubbish. You must always want to dominate. Always, always, always want to dominate. I'm going to read some of these comments and I'm going to shut down this video. Oh, Jesus. The blacks. The blacks. True, Aqua. How do you let foreigners come to your land and take over everything? It makes no sense when you know every corner of your street. So when you're psychologically fucked, they don't give a fuck about us. No one gives a fuck about black people. I can tell you that for free. There's no race or country in the world that loves blacks. What do blacks bring into your country? 
if Japanese people are coming into South Africa, we, we have some kind of assumption of what they bring, the skills. If Americans are coming here, we have an idea of what Americans and Germans are bringing. What do black people bring? When black people come into a certain country, what are they bringing? In America, they were brought for slavery to come work. But today, we don't want to be slaves. We don't want to be labor. What, what are you bringing? If a bunch of black people are going to Hong Kong, what are they going there with? Are they master programmers? Are they brilliant at maths? Are they brilliant at building shit? Black people are the best engineers. What are black people bringing? Or are they coming to dance around and sing? Because <laughs> that's what blacks are good at. Aye. No one cares about blacks, man. Blacks don't offer value. Know them. Uh, don't. When you bring it up, they shut you down. I know them. I don't I know. It's awkward okay, again. True, we don't have shit. Uh... They will never give back shit. You can't expect winners to give back their trophies and medals. They take everything by force, manipulate and conquer, plus violence is what they use. And we need to... I hear black people constantly defending we can't become like our enemies. White people are violent and they are evil. Don't be like them. Rise above. Ooh, shame. Jeez. Hmm. The rest of us are going to oppress you. Because clearly you like being oppressed. Thank you. I love the way you think. Thank you, Aqua. Of course, they lost. Uh, true talk. They're smart. Ayanda says, that's just the nature of the beast. But what do you propose? There's reason why there were negotiations. And the first one is that white people are still in power because if they were not. So I'm trying to open that. If they were not, then it wouldn't be a matter of negotiations. Talk about the current negotiations, but rather action. They lost because they were desperate to give their people some form of achievement. Um, I think he's talking about the ANC here and their, and their compromised negotiations. Every other race are benefiting themselves from us expect our, except ourselves. Uh, and the government talks about radical economic change, but the honest truth is that there's nothing radical about what they are currently doing, which amounts to nothing really. So we need bold leaders that are going to implement radical change, not talk too much and do nothing like the EFF. And the truth of the matter is that black people have a huge vacuum for, for strong, aggressive leaders who are visionary, have a plan and who are willing to do whatever it takes. I think Malcolm X spoke about, um, what's that line? Uh, no matter what. There's a, there's, a, there's a line Malcolm X has, which is basically, oh, by any means necessary. By any means necessary. And I know Huey Newton of the Black Panthers in America was also big on black people need to get organized. And the Black Panthers were a militant group. They believed in guns and using violence to get means. You know, and I remember one of the leaders of the Nation of Islam was talking about how violence is the only language that white people understand. When you try to speak to white language in words... <laughs> White people don't understand words. They'll speak those words back to you. So what? But once you bring violence to their door, that's a language they understand. Bring violence to the door of the white man and he starts sitting up and he starts listening. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa let, let's talk, brother. Let's talk. So we need, we need strong leaders. There's a huge vacuum for that. And a lot of our strong leaders, unfortunately, were killed. Steve Beagle, even though I don't think he was violent. Robert Sobugwe, guys like Chris Hani were obviously killed. Malcolm X was killed. Martin Luther King Jr., even though he wasn't violent, was killed as well. Uh, Thomas Sankara was killed. Uh, not a black guy, but I think we've adopted him as a black brother. Uh, Ernesto Guevara de la Serna. Uh, Shea Guevara was killed. A lot of the strong black leaders are killed. And in my study of history, I realized that one of the tricks, or one of the advantages black people or white people use, white people try their best to not attack groups of blacks. They go for the head. They go and they kill the leaders. I don't remember black people anywhere in history going for white leaders. Black people want to kill groups of white people. And they normally go for the weakest. You want to go for poor, racist, white trash, whites. Kill a bunch of them and pat yourself on the back. Those people are useless. You need to go for the head. I'm not going to mention the names, but you know the white leaders in this country. You know the, the, the big economic heads, white heads in this country. If someone was bold enough to go and kill those guys, that would be action. That would be proper action. Not killing random whites who earn a lousy salary. That doesn't change anything. White people don't go for the lousy blacks at the bottom. They go for the head. 
they jail the Nelson Mandela's of this world. They, they capture the Nelson Mandela's of this world. They kill the Chris Hannis. They kill the, the Steve Beagles. They don't bother with the Riff Raff. Because they know the Riff Raff, as it's been proven, will vote for whatever they say. They'll beg them for jobs. But the head, the head is the problem. And we need to learn that strategy as well. Learn to go for the head. I think Thanos says this in Avengers. When Thor throws the, the hammer, what's the name of that hammer? Whatever, into his chest. He says you should have gone for the head. That's war strategy. You defeat the head, you're done. If I'm coming after your tribe, if I'm coming after your church, if I'm coming after your racial group, I go for your leader and I destroy and I dominate that person. I have killed all of you because that person was your light and your guide. But our leaders don't have that. Anyways, I hope you guys are having a great day. Uh, enjoy level four. I know you guys are having a fucking party like the lockdown is over, but enjoy level four. Chat to you guys soon. Shop shop.